Thank you very much for uh, inviting me here on this momentous occasion. Uh, <clears throat> the future of India in the context of economy and industry and in the context of the world as it's emerging today can be best understood if we first knew something about the past of India, which has not been so far fairly described in our history books because these history books were written by those who occupied our country for a substantial period, which is more or less the last thousand years. India today by modern analysis was the most developed country for centuries and held the position of the having the largest share of the world GDP for a long time, first as number one and then later after 1700 as number two to China. China India really began going towards, downwards towards the state of poverty in uh, starting with 1800 when Britain was having its industrial revolution and uh, it sunk to become one of the poorest countries by 1947. We could have revived very quickly after the British left, but unfortunately, Mr. Jawaharlal Nehru had this fascination for the Soviet economic model, which was totally unsuited for India. And the Soviet economic model essentially was to extract resources from agriculture to finance industrialization, particularly the big, large sectors, which are popularly called as the heavy, sec heavy industry. But India had been bled completely bone dry in agriculture because the 1857 uh, first war of India's independence, which the British popularly call in their country as the mutiny, it was not a mutiny, it was an attempt to overthrow the British government and, and the British government was, the British authorities were overthrown for about six, seven months, but then it was crushed and that rebellion was financed both in terms of money and uh, men by the agricultural sector. And so they were targeted for revenue extraction and it was done by a very cruel system. And therefore the agriculture was in shambles when we became independent in 1947. So the Soviet model was not suitable for that particular reason. There were no resources to extract. And uh, we faced the consequences of that in 1965 to 67, when there was a drought, the lack of rainfall, and that meant importing grains from abroad. And we had to depend on the Americans to send shiploads of grain uh, to feed our people. At that time, the first realization came that we had to change our strategy. In any case, the Soviet economic model was not only unsuitable for India, it was unsuitable for practically anywhere else in the world where it was adopted. The communists, of course, did a lot of propaganda that uh, there is no inflation in Soviet Union, there's no unemployment in Soviet Union, there's no poverty in Soviet Union. But in 1991, we found there's no Soviet Union also. Uh, it has broken up into 16 countries. And when East Germany and West Germany came together, we knew what a difference there was between a democratic market economy that West Germany represented and a command Soviet economy, which East Germany recommended. The Chinese also have abandoned the Soviet economic model. And we took a long time to abandon it. The first time when I became Commerce Minister, the first blueprints were prepared for a market reforms, but it was really implemented by Mr. Narsimha Rao, who succeeded us. And of course, I was also held a ministerial position in his government, uh, not as minister, but as chairman of the WTO matters with cabinet rank. 
And during that period, we transformed our economy to a 40-year average of 3.5% per year to about 8% per year. And that 8% is more or less continuing as a norm, maybe sometimes 7 but generally speaking, we have now a much higher growth rate. Today, India needs much more than 7 or 8% growth rate. Today, India needs at least for 10 years continuously a 10% growth rate in GDP. And uh, technically speaking, that is easy to reach because, uh, as economists know, as a rule of thumb, that uh, the rate of investment, which is total investment divided by income, by national or GDP, that is the rate of investment. And that rate of investment is divided by what is called as the capital output ratio, or the efficiency in the use of capital. And that uh, ratio gives you the growth rate in the economy and GDP. And India had, has about 36% of its GDP as a rate of investment, uh, including what comes from abroad, which is not much, it's about 2%. So that 36% divided by four and a half uh, as the capital output ratio gives you about 7 8% per year. So in simplistic terms, either you raise the rate of savings to, to a higher number, or you reduce the, the inefficiency in the use of capital. Uh, you can achieve, it is a, a within striking distance to achieve a 10% growth rate. I would say we should try to have a rate of investment of 40%, and that should be uh, divided by a more efficient use of capital, which should, should be four, which will give you 10%. And if you can reduce it to even less to three and a half, you'll get an even higher rate of growth. But if you want to solve the problem of poverty and unemployment, we need a 10% growth rate for 10 years. That's feasible, it's, uh, it's achievable, and certainly if Mr. Modi makes me finance minister, I'll definitely get it achieved. Because macroeconomics needs, needs an economist, uh, not somebody who's not trained as an economist. It's a, such a complex international system today that anything happens anywhere else in the world also affects us. So therefore, in that concept, uh, uh, I may have jokingly said about my becoming finance minister, but I think the finance minister should be someone who's trained in economics and knows politics. And unfortunately, there's only one, and that's me. That's why I said it should be me. Now, how do we go about raising the rate of savings. At the present, you'll be surprised to know that the bulk of our domestic savings comes from the households in India. This is completely different from other countries. United States, the rate of household savings is actually negative because everything there is on credit. It's only if you include the pension funds that the rate of savings becomes 2% of GDP. Whereas in India, the household savings is 29% of GDP. That's out of the 36%, 29% is, oh, is uh, the component of 29% is due to households. And this is uh, an old Indian habit. Very, we are, no, we are not big spenders. And uh, the women in India are particularly very careful to hedge against risk of the future. And therefore, they have been, uh, saving has been a habit. Even China, which is uh, culturally not very different from us, there the rate of household savings is only 15%. So India, if it wants to raise the rate of savings, has to consider how to encourage the people to uh, to uh, raise uh, to save more, and one of the ways of doing it is, in my opinion, in this present current context, considering all things taken together, is actually to abolish income tax. 
If the income tax in the country is abolished as a system, it's not something that has not been done in other countries. During Industrial Revolution, Britain also had abolished income tax. But if you abolish income tax, it's easy to do. It has its impact immediately. Instead of telling people it will all filter down in the future, our policies, we'll build so many smart cities, we will do this, we'll do that. These are all things which will take time to filter down. But income tax is a harassment instrument in our country today. And it's the same thing with the corporate sector also. Uh, but I'm talking essentially of personal incomes. And this would raise the uh, rate of savings uh, consolidated or the rate of investment to 40% very easily. So we need a policy change. So it's within reach. It, it's something that can be done. Most people are in, the, in our India. India is one of the weaknesses we have inherited from our British past, is that uh, we are very conservative. We are always apprehensive about the future. Now, if you have no risk-taking mentality, you can't have dynamic economic growth. You have to learn to take risk. And this is risky, of course, but it's not that risky. After all, how much is the total personal income tax contribution to our budget? It's a small amount compared to the overall budget, it's a total of 4 lakh crore rupees. Recently, I have demonstrated through the Supreme Court by filing what the Americans call as class action litigation, and in India it's called public interest litigation, by abolishing these licenses given on a discretionary basis, licenses for telecom uh, uh, companies, the licenses to get spectrum, and uh, that abolition was replaced by an auction, and that auction is today giving you at 2G level, 2G the generation, the second generation spectrum, you are, you are getting the exact amount which you have lost, uh, would have lost by abolition of income tax. Similarly, if you were to start auctioning, now we are, there is even 5G is coming very soon. We have already got 3G and 4G, which has not been properly implemented so far. You auction these, and this is not the, a one-time uh, issue. It, is, it happens every year. Similarly, the coal, coal blocks, that is the mines for uh, extracting coal, they were previously handed over uh, on a discretionary basis. That means favoritism of those in power. Actually, if you were, and of course, again, the Supreme Court, and again on a class action litigation, abolished the uh, discretionary allocation of coal blocks. And we have yet to begin seriously the, uh, the, the auctioning of these coal blocks, and we will do that. That's a one-time exception, but in one blow, you can get 11 lakh crores, which would be about almost two, uh, two and a half times the personal income tax revenue. So we should think out of the box, instead of saying, I can't do this because where will I get my resources? We have to uh, be able to find alternative sources. There are plenty of other op alternative sources. The Indian uh, politicians and top businessmen have illegal bank accounts abroad. And uh, the total amount is a, a, a one, it's almost a trillion dollars. And it's, uh, well, I would say conservatively, 120 lakh crore rupees. That means 30 times, 30 times the income tax revenue. And uh, the United Nations resolution of 2005 now enables countries to get these monies back. And the, the steps that have been taken is described in the United Nations Convention, has been used by Egypt to get the money um, stashed abroad of Mubarak, in Libya for, uh, uh, for Gaddafi, and even the Filipinos, with the help of the American assistance, they were able to get Marcos money back. So this money can be brought back, and that's 120,000, uh, 120 crore lakh, 120 lakh crores, which uh, which is roughly depending on what the exchange rate is, 
At the time when I did the calculation, it was 60 rupees to a dollar, so it would be about, a, about, a, uh, about $2 trillion. That's the outside estimate. Well, one trillion you can easily get. So there is no shortage of resources in India. And what we need is the ability to think out of the box. And this is one of the things that needs to be done. I'm saying that because we were a country once upon a time developed, and we were not just developed in uh, digging holes in the ground and getting oil and making money on that. We were people who were uh, on the front, front line of mathematics, science, of medicine, surgery, and even we had manuals on how to build an aeroplane, which uh, today people may find it ridiculous, but later on you will find out after reading it that it was a substantive manual which is now being translated, just recently found, can be translated. We have also done on health things which the Western world is today beginning to slowly accept, like yoga, uh, meditation, and uh, the NASA has found, as you can find out by Googling what I'm just saying uh, through the search engines, that Sanskrit is the best and uh, most appropriate language to store knowledge for artificial intelligence. And this is, a this is a discovery of the NASA and published in their journal of artificial intelligence. So there are, India had achieved all-round development ahead of every other country. In fact, they would be surprised. Uh, I spent so many years in, in, the, in Cambridge, Massachusetts. In the nearby town of Belmont, there's a huge pond, and it's called the Fresh Pond. And in, the, in winter, it, of course, uh, completely freezes, and you can walk across that pond. Around the pond, the municipality had constructed a walking path so for morning exercise, it was an ideal place to go. And there's a, there were, once I saw in my walk a, uh, a, on a pole a notice, a, a board, which said, here stood Tudor Ice Company, which exported ice to India. And the date given is 1636. So I was completely taken aback. So I went and Googled it and finally found one book on Tudor Ice Company. And the tale it describes is, is something which is very heartwarming for me and surprise, would be surprising for you if you read it. And that is that traders used to come from Salem, Massachusetts, all the way to India, to Kanchipuram, which is in Tamil, Tamil Nadu. And then by, upon arrival, they would buy cloth, uh, spices, so many other things which they don't get, didn't get in their own country. And one day, the king of uh, Kanchipuram was a Vijayanagaram empire. I mean, he was the, uh, the, the, uh, those, that empire which was started in Karnataka and spread right up to the borders of Bengal, the uh, Vijayanagaram empire. The, uh, the king asked these American traders whether they were comfortable and there's anything he could do for them. And they said, yes, we have one problem. We come with empty ships fill them up and take them back to Massachusetts. Can you not buy something from us? So he said, well, what is there to buy? India produces everything we need. When say insisted, then he said, I have never seen snow in my life, ice in my life, because in Tamil Nadu, there's no question of ice. The, the, there are only three climates in Tamil Nadu. One is hot and the other is hotter, and the third is hottest. So therefore, he said, uh, uh, I, uh, for me to go to the Himalayas and see ice is, you know, it's a long journey. But I hear in your country it falls from the sky. So therefore, why don't you bring me ice? I'll buy it. And so the traders used a fresh pond, built a company called Tudor Ice Company, and put sawdust and cut up the thing into ice blocks and took it all the way to India. So the first export from the United States was ice. And you see how far they have come. And that is something that we have to learn from American enterprise. So I think the Indian development capability was demonstrated, Indian innovative capability. Thousand years of foreign invasion has changed our psychologies into thinking in terms of risk aversion. We are, we are the most risk averse. Aver uh, averting country in the world. 
So now we have to think out of the box and say our target is to overtake China immediately. And in the long run, we will be competitors with the Americans because that brings me to the second topic, that the American miracle is entirely due to their innovative minds. They have been, for the last 100 years, bringing innovations after innovations, whether it is electricity, the bulb, uh, electric bulbs, whether it's the telephone, whether it's the fax machines, or whether it's the, the ultimately the end of the last century, the internet and uh, the, the laptops. These have completely revolutionized the way you, you do business. They have completely reduced uh, in a huge way the transaction costs of doing business. So the Americans are great innovators. But we Indians have shown in small ways that we can, give a, we can also be great innovation nations. And our country today has this great advantage that we have the youngest population of the large countries. 70% of our population is below the age of 35. And this is this age group, 24 to 35, which is the innovative, when it's the most productive period for innovation. And this population, if it's properly educated, it's not a very difficult thing to do. It's a question of focus. And that, this, this generation, if it is converted into giving up its risk aversion and thinking it's my, it's about, it's about the future of India in terms of thinking out of the box and creating new things for India, I think India would become easily the fastest growing country in the world for a long time and certainly overtake China in my, uh, much faster terms. You know, the Chinese model, I must explain to you, is based on one simple formula. Get semi-processed products from East Asia, add value to it, and export it to the United States and Europe. Now, the East Asian countries no more can afford to said uh, finished products to the United States because the labor costs are much higher, uh, they become high. It's become these, most of them have become near developed countries. So they find it cheaper to send it to China and uh, get it, uh, the, the expensive part, the labor, uh, labor cost part reduced. And they, then the Chinese export it. And they put uh, made in China, it looks like everything is being produced in China. But in fact, most of what industrial products that China exports is really made in East Asia, and only value is added. For example, Lenovo, most of the parts of the, the essential parts of the computer, they are made in Taiwan. <coughs> but uh, the key, keyboard, the glass, the uh, covering, these are all made in China. But the stamp on it is made in China. And uh, this is something where we have an equal advantage, except the Chinese have a wonderful, uh, <coughs> uh, they have a wonderful uh, infrastructural system which they have consciously built, whereas we have a lousy one, and uh, because it has been target of corruption, and so this is the only advantage they enjoy. But we have a democracy, we have a rule of law, we have courts, we have intellectual property rights, which are far superior. We ought to be able to divert that traffic to India. And certainly, we, <coughs> along with Indonesia, control the Malacca Strait. So India is in strategically very strong position if, you, if the leadership starts thinking in those terms. But I would say, uh, <coughs> excuse me, I would say that there are so many innovations ready to be made, which Indians can do, which the Americans will not do. For example, take India's possession of 60% of the world's thorium. Thorium is going to be the future for nuclear reactors because the uranium is running out of stock and probably by 2015, you will not have uh, any uranium left for your reactors. So thorium would be the substitute. The Americans are already doing research in that. We have been doing, had been doing research on thorium, 
And uh, there were three stages to be crossed before it could be converted into U233, uh, and that could be used in the, in the reactors. And this is a much cleaner reactor than uranium-238 reactors. But we stopped the research in 2005 after the Indo-US uh, nuclear agreement, and that needs to be revived. In the event we do that, there is no shortage of power, clean power, that we will ever have. Probably we will have enough power to export it to our neighbor, neighboring countries. Here is a potential which we are not using. You see from newspapers, Karnataka and Tamil Nadu, they are all the time fighting over uh, how many glasses of water extra you can get. And uh, it becomes a huge uh, issue in every, just before every election. But there cannot be a shortage of water for a country like, for a state like Tamil Nadu because of its long coastlines. Israel and Saudi Arabia and the Middle East now are using uh, desalination of seawater for supplying all the water that you want. In our own country, there are uh, uh, islands of usage of desalination. For example, the Atomic uh, um, Energy Commission's uh, plant, the nuclear plant called the Kalpakam in Tamil Nadu, the coast of Tamil Nadu, where the Tamil Nadu SM, uh, municipality declined to supply water because it didn't have enough water coming out of Kaveri. And therefore, the scientists decided to set up a uh, desalination plant. And today, the only part of Tamil Nadu where you get uh, 24 hours of water, and that too, clean filtered water through the taps, is in the colonies of the uh, Kalpagam, uh, scientists' uh, residential colonies. So there, it has been demonstrated there. Same thing with this reliance in Jamnagar, where they have a, a, a polyester or uh, they have a, a, a factory which is dealing with producing synthetics. And uh, the local Jamnagar uh, municipality told them that they could not supply water because there wasn't enough water. So the uh, Reliance put up a desalination plant, which they imported from abroad, namely probably from Israel. And they, they produce so much water that today they are selling it to the municipality of the Jamnagar to, so that the people of uh, Jamnagar can get water. So uh, this is not an innovation in the sense something new is going to be discovered for which you have to do long years of research and development. But like this, we have large possibilities of converting our present uh, um, constraints into something of assets. We have rivers which have flooding every year and whose 90% of which, whose waters go into the oceans. And we have rivers where there's no water, like Waigai in, uh, in Tamil Nadu or Kaveri, which is short of supply. So if you were to create a water grid of transferring water from surplus uh, rivers to deficit rivers, there should not be a water problem. Furthermore, you will have canals going through areas which have never seen water, like Rilasima of Andhra Pradesh, never seen water in, in abundance, and the canals will have to pass through that. So there will be a huge boost to agriculture. So this is another area where we should think uh, very clearly about it. And this could produce the major change. Third thing is, India even today, with all its poverty in agriculture, is the cheapest producer of most agricultural products. For example, rice, we sell it at once internationally at one-sixth the, international, the price the, the Japanese are willing to pay. We, uh, cotton is cheaper than Egypt's, uh, and it is... Uh, sold uh, 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 because we don't have adequate amounts and there's demand inside. So therefore, it is sold, but it doesn't earn much revenue for us. There is uh, uh, fruits. Mangoes are in Europe imported from Africa, and they are terrible compared to the uh, mangoes that we produce. Uh, we, we could do it. We have a huge potential for export of milk, provided we can pasteurize it, bottle it. And we have how many cows? We have 150 million cows. 
And these are what cows? Boss Indicus. And today in the United States supermarket, you can go and see a separate carton called A2 milk. And below it is written milk from cows from India. Because the Boss Indicus, as opposed to the American Boss Taurus, produces milk which is far more nutritious, has far more uh, health adv uh, advancing uh, qualities than the Boss uh, Taurus uh, milk, which is easily available. And the A2 milk in cartons is sold at a much higher price than uh, cows from the American cow, from uh, milk from the American cows. Now, you have 150 million. Half of them, are, most of them are starving. And their average yield per year is only 200 liters per year. One average Israeli cow produces 11,000 liters. Imagine if 150 million cows in India started producing the Israeli average. I could come to this conference swimming in milk. That much milk will be produced in our country. Look at the potential. Same thing with crops. The average yield of crops in India compared to the uh, pilot projects or the experimental plots of the Indian Institute of Agriculture, you'd be surprised. The average yield in India compared to the uh, experimental plots is only one-sixth. That is, you can increase production in this very land with proper uh, irrigation, water, uh, pesticides, etc., good seeds, you can have six times the production. And furthermore, India is a country where you can grow three crops a year because of its, its weather. The United States has five months of the year. You can't do any agriculture because of snow. Same thing with Europe, good parts of China. Here is a country that has land, and only 25% of our land is, has more than one crop growing. So India is, if you ask what is the status of India, it has got a young population, and that will last you at least as the largest young population till 2060. Educate them, give priority to education and do it, and, uh, and bring about this transformation where people are able to stand on their own feet. They go in for risk-taking projects, take up uh, uh, startups and so on, uh, willingly instead of getting, going for government jobs uh, or steady jobs. Uh, this search for stability, which is dominating the Indian mind, this stability is, uh, is a very damaging uh, attribute to have. It has come essentially out of the period of the colonial period when we, we made joining the civil service as something something I need to be done. One has to learn from America, and you can't get a job anywhere else, you go to government. That sort of atmosphere has to be built where people prefer to stand on their own feet than get steady job. So this population should be motivated. So research and development, these are the areas. I mean, there is nothing to stop India from becoming a world economic power. And certainly, I can tell you that when we do that, our challenge will not be China. It will be the United States of America because it will be a fight for, uh, for, uh, for innovation, supremacy in the, in the field of innovation. And we are Indians are already doing quite well in America uh, without, um, you know, with, with the present education system. So if you have a superior e education system as the Americans have, the university system, American school system is nothing much to rave about, but certainly the university system is is a classic, it's, a, it's something to be proud of. And if you were to bring about the same questioning mind, the risk taking amongst the younger generation, we can transform and become uh, a challenger in, uh, in uh, innovation. Today we have made a name in software, but we still don't have a, a design. We don't have a Microsoft. Uh, uh, equivalent. We are essentially what we'd call as the uh, software blue-collar workers, because we are only doing more efficiently what uh, uh, has been uh, what the American uh, workers are doing. That's about all. But the fact is we aren't designing anything. We are not creating new, new types of software. 
And that's a very dangerous way to develop because you see the Japanese. The Japanese growth, as Michael Potter, who was a professor at Harvard Business School, wrote, is a quality enhancing growth which has its limits. It is not based on innovations. And today, the Japanese, uh, after the 1997, have not been able to recover uh, to the, pre the earlier position of growing so fast that they could, they could buy Rockefeller Center and uh, threaten America. And today, they are no threat to America at all because of the fact that the, the system they built was not for, uh, for sustained growth. For sustained growth, economic growth has to be backed by innovation, and economists have calculated that 65% of Europe and uh, America after the Industrial Revolution was contributed by new innovations. And it is new innovations that India needs to focus, for which we have the manpower already. And what it needs is a focus. Of course, we need to have our uh, international alliances so worked out so that we can uh, be able to be facilitated where we are weak. The Israelis and the Americans have a great deal of capacity to transfer research and development results, and therefore our relationship naturally has to be very close. China is our neighbor. We can bilaterally have good relations with them. But the fact is that today, the, if India wants to become a world power economically, industrially, it must, must move towards new ways of doing the production. And as I told you, agriculture will produce results immediately. It will transform the poverty situation in agriculture. So I see India in a very, very hopeful situation. Can we, present politicians, transform it? In my opinion, we have to reverse what has been done in the last 50 years. It's not going to be easy. Mr. Narasimha Rao tried to do it the fast way. He came, he, 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 dis he removed the quotas, licenses in one blow. And what happened? These, those who were the rent earners, who were making a killing in the black market by selling the licenses and quotas which are given by discretion by the government, they were the ones who lost immediately. And the people of India were told that it will all filter down to higher growth rates and therefore you'll be benefited. But the propaganda took its toll that this is all for the rich, though, uh, all these relaxation. And Narsimha Rao, after accelerating our growth rate from 3.5% to 8% in just five years, lost the elections. And uh, what is the reason? Because the deprivation of the vested interests of the old system lost immediately, while the beneficiaries of this economic reform were not seeing any reforms. Thing. So we have to design our package in such a way that some things are done in such a way that people realize immediately. And that's why income tax abolition is something I give so much importance to, because it will happen instantaneously. And people will see some benefits, and then they will be ready to do the sacrifice. We need, therefore, also to restructure our uh, uh, interest rate systems to motivate people. India cannot be driven by, by threats. India has demonstrated during the state of emergency they may be poor, they may be backward, they may be illiterate, but when it comes to democracy, they are as steadfast as anybody can be. In fact, the results of the 1977 elections show that the maximum revolt in India against the autocracy of Mrs. Gandhi and the suspension of the Constitution came from the poorest areas of India. The whole of Uttar Pradesh, every single seat of Congress, they were defeated. Indira Gandhi lost her own seat. Her son lost her own, his own seat. Whereas the educated South, which is India, which is Tamil Nadu, uh, Andhra, um, uh, Karnataka, and Kerala, they voted for Congress. They voted for dictatorship. And a uh, large number of seats were given to the Congress party. How do you explain that? It's because actually our English education makes us more slavish than the lack of education. We put it very. Otherwise, how do you explain the illiterate masses of UP, Bihar, Madhya Pradesh, Rajasthan, uh, Haryana could wipe out the Congress, not a single seat, 
which gave my party the majority to come and remove all these, uh, these uh, autocratic and uh, um, dictatorial measures that were put in the name of the emergency. So the, the basic material is uh, very sound in India, and it is, it is there that we have to be educated and brought forward. And that can be only done by a change in mindset. And therefore, I'll conclude with an example. If you are large numbers, if your mindset is not correct, you can never be strong. 1,000 goats in one place <coughs> are standing, and one tiger comes. The majority is with the, in fact, overwhelming majority is with the goats. But the moment they see the tiger, fear grips them, and they all run helter-skelter. How do you explain that? They can easily, with their thousands, surround the goat, uh, the uh, tiger, and kick him to death. But their mindset is that, fear. Seeing the tiger, they run. Similarly, strength is not enough. For example, in a circus, you will have five strong lions and one lean ringmaster will walk into the cage of theirs. After locking the gate, he will start ordering these lions. He will be face-to-face -face with them. He'll tell them, climb up. They will all climb up on the table as directed. He'll ask them to pass, jump through balls of fire, through a ring of fire. They'll do that. He'll ask them to open their mouths. He will, they will open their mouths. He'll put his head in each one of them. And none of the lions would do a thing to him. They can easily bite his head off and finish him. But they don't do it. Because from the time they were cubs, they were being brought up to obey. And so power means nothing to them. They may be very strong and healthy. In fact, in, in a circus, they are very well fed. And yet they obey. It's because the mind has been prepared for that. So politicians are also like that. If they are not brought up properly to, to think out of the box, then they become totally submissive. We had an example of Manmohan Singh as prime minister. He was sitting in the chair of the prime ministership, but he was so afraid of an Italian lady that whatever she wanted done, he would do. And even though he was a scholar, even though he was an honest man, even though he was upright, but he didn't have the nerve to say no to her. That's called mindset. And that is basically what is lacking in India today. We need a new mindset, a questioning mind, not a mind which is, uh, looks for stability, but to see how a problem, identify a problem of the country and start set about it, try and solve it. This is the way to do it, but I think it is coming because I can see I came to Indian politics 40 years ago, and I see a major change in this country. And the younger generation is now more willing to you know, take the established truths that the British civilized us, the British made India. We were so millions of little pieces quarreling with each other, none of which is true. In fact, India has an extraordinary record which the world has not recognized. We are the only country. You see, invasions have taken place all over the world. The Zoroastrians used to rule Persia. And the Zoroastrians uh, were 100% of Persia, which is now called Iran. And Islam conquered uh, Persia. And in 15 years, they converted the entire population, except those who ran to India and became Parsis in our country. 100% of Iran was converted to Islam. Mesopotamia and Babylon, the neighborhood, which is now known together as Iraq, in 17 years they were able to convert after conquest to 100% uh, Islam. Egypt was also converted in 21 years to 100% Islam. Europe was converted to Christianity in 50 years. But we had 700 years rule of Islam in various parts of India and then 200 years of the British. And yet, today, we are not 100% Hindu, but we are 80% Hindu, which is a record which no other country enjoys of having fought. And that fighting is not reflected in our history books. The way Shivaji fought, the way the Vijayanagar Empire fought, 
the way the Ahom dynasty in Assam fought, and the way that uh, the Sikhs, particularly Guru Gobind Singh, broke the back of the Mughals so that they could never get up again. These are not recorded in our history. Our history is to prepare a mindset to obey, to think inferior, or, you know, think in, be diffident about yourself, have an inferiority complex. That is the mindset which is crucial for India to change, and then India will once again become the leader in the world with all its resources. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, the Honorable Member of Parliament, Dr. Subramaniam Sami. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, if you did enjoy that, it was such an invigorating talk, please uh, put your hands together once again for a fantastic keynote address. Um, Dr. Swami, would you be open to taking some questions? I'm going to just set the tone uh, for uh, the questions to be asked here. Um, no political questions, please. We request you do ask uh, economic questions, do ask questions on the topic that he's spoken about, and we'd be more than glad. Uh, if you can just raise your hand, we'll have Mike runners who will run to you. If you have any questions. Yes. Yeah. Thank, you, Dr. Oh, Thank you, Dr. Swami. Thank you, Dr. Swami, for a uh, very invigorating and enlightening speech. Uh, my question is uh, related to what you said. I fully agree with you, with your view, that we should be thinking out of the box. In fact, if we have to ensure employment and employability for our youth, for our millions of youth, I think ideas should be our only currency. I fully agree with you on that. However, looking at uh, the way, I mean, looking at the market economy, the way it exists today in the context of, you know, our democratic system, um, would like to have your views on that because uh, does it also not create tremendous income inequalities? I mean, if you look at, for example, U.S., the top one, uh, top one tenth of the top one percent practically controls ninety percent of the wealth, and we are also basically s we seem to be aping them and we seem to be following the same the same path. So, in that context, uh, if that is to be true then what kind of system would you propose? Because this also then results in scandals and you know, all the things which you mentioned. Well, first of all, the uh, United States is a democracy and it's not a dictatorship. And uh, I think the people there are, appear to be more interested in jobs than in uh, raising these issues of inequality. Yes, there are intellectuals who raise it, but there's no revolution in America. There's not even uh, hope for any of the communist parties in any of the elections there, or even socialists. So uh, when you have a democracy, and there is reasonable faith that the democracy is not rigged, I think uh, uh, that should be left to the people, whether they want jobs or they want to reduce inequality. Uh, yes, if the inequality leads to splurging of the money and uh, debasing um, values uh, through the use of money. Yes, then there is a question case for intervention. But nobody is for laissez-faire. We are for a market economy where the government functions to the extent possible as an umpire and uh, there also works not by threatening people uh, with uh, uh, court cases or sending them to jail, but much more by incentives. That is the system that I we are trying to work towards. We have inherited uh, almost 70 years of more or less socialism. And to dismantle that, to tame the bureaucracy, get new people uh, who think differently, that's going to take a little time. But there is no doubt that the growth rate today is much higher than 3.5% per year when uh, we had socialism, and there was a more, much better distribution of income. So whether you want that, or uh, you will be satisfied with 3.5% growth rate provided the inequalities are uh, removed is another matter. Second, Indian culture has never highly valued wealth. Americans do. They have a one-dimensional society. In our country, I remember when I first went to Harvard as a student to get my PhD, 
my classmate asked me, how is it possible for you Indians to follow a man like Mahatma Gandhi? So I said, why? What's wrong with him? He says, he's not properly dressed. So I told him, in your country, your leaders have to be properly dressed. He said, yes, they must have good, uh, good uh, uh, suits and they must have shining shoes, etc. They can't be walking around with a, a little cloth wrapped around his loins and then uh, all of you follow him. That is a very telling difference. In fact, he told me, that my friend told me that Kennedy won a debate because uh, uh, Nixon came without shaving or he had a five o'clock shadow as they call it. And so we have a value attached to the accumulation of wealth, but we venerate the most those who are what we call as gyanis and tyagis, that is those who have made sacrifices and the simplicity as you go higher. So that thing, that has to be the thing. It's this, this uh, feeling that I, nobody should have more than me. That's a uh, jealousy generating sentiment. If a person is able and is the society rewards his ability, it should be accepted, provided you got your minimum. Yes, if the minimum is not there, then of course it's a, it becomes a different matter. But India is not that situation. We have policy corrections to be made so that these, uh, these uh, inequalities be moved. Even in industry, the last governor of Reserve Bank went on raising the interest rate, saying that uh, uh, to control inflation, I have to raise interest rates. But the cost of capital also went up. As a consequence, these small and me me uh, medium industries, which have no other source except to take loans from the banks, they had to start collapsing, which, which is the reason why during this last four years of our rule, the unemployment situation has got worse, not better, because of these high interest rates. And uh, it was like a, a doctor saying that he couldn't bring down the temperature of a patient, so he thought of killing him, because that's the only way to bring down the temperature. Now, the same way you raise the interest rate because that's the only way to bring down inflation, that shows bankruptcy of thinking. So that kind of thinking where you induce in inequalities, because if those who are well-to-do in the industrial world, they took money from uh, abroad also, they were able to compensate by getting lower interest rates abroad. But in our country, the small and medium industries collapsed, led to unemployment, led to inequity even in the industrial sector. That kind of policy, we have to be careful. So I would say the interest rate should uh, more or less equal the rate of interest you pay for fixed deposits, for savings. If you have that equality, then I don't think it will create un, uh, any disparity. So disparity is an overdone thing. Once the basics are achieved, then we can de deal with the question of inequality. Thank you, sir. Uh, so there is Hello. already one gentleman with a mic. Can we also have a mic? Sir. Hello. Sir, sir, my question, please. Sir, do we have? Sir, yeah. He's right there in the center. So we have the casteism. We have the reservation systems. And we have other issues in our countries. How we are going to take ahead our country in 2050 and what can be your vision? With, with all these conflicts, <laughs> thank you. Well, I think, uh, first of all, I've always felt that uh, conflicts and disorder is a normality in India. If everything became normal, then I would think that something abnormal is going on in India. We have got used to uh, this. So anyway, I'm not justifying what's happening, but first let me get some conceptual part clear. When you say caste, I don't know what you mean. Do you mean the Varna system or you mean the Jati system? You see, there are two dimensions to our social system. One is the Varna system, the other is the Jati system. The Jati system is really used for marriages uh, and that is based on blood. So you're a Jat, it's a, that's not your, that's not your Varna, that's your Jati. So that is uh, for a limited purpose. Uh, when it comes to uh, uh, Varna, Varna is Brahmin, Kshatriya, that sort of fourfold division. That had nothing to do with birth. If it had something to do with birth, then how do you explain Vishwamitra who was born in a 
family whose father and mother were Kshatriyas. And he became the Maharishi, the Rishi of Rishis. Veda Vyasa, who wrote the Mahabharat, he was, his mother was a fisherwoman. Kalidasa was a Vanavasi. He was cutting t branches of trees till he became the greatest poet of India. And he was surprised to know that Valmiki was born in a Dalit family. He became a Maharishi and he wrote the Ramayana. And any Brahmin broke the law, he had to face consequences. Ravan was a Brahmin. Most, uh, most Tamil politicians don't know that. I have to educate them from time to time. That he was, he was not even a South Indian. He was born in a place called Bisrak village, which is in Noida, which is just across Delhi. So, therefore, this rigidity that has come, that a Brahmin son is a Brahmin automatically, is, is a, is a uh, what is we call in Sanskrit as Vikriti. That is, it's a, it's a deterioration. So it's, uh, it's something which is not uh, correct. So what is correct is that according to DNA studies, which has been published in the Journal of Genetics of the University of Cambridge, the University of Mysore, and the University of Houston, all Indians have the same DNA. I have challenged even Muslims, like OYC, said, come with me to a microbiological laboratory. I'll prove that your DNA and my DNA is the same. That is, you didn't come from abroad. You are a part of this country. And somewhere along the line, your, your ancestors converted. So this, all these divisions have been fostered. Your history book has been distorted. And so much of these uh, things that come up, I have reached a situation where you have created tension. Take Dr. Ambedkar. He was born in a scheduled caste family. He was educated by a Brahmin who gave, <coughs> who gave his name to him. But Ambedkar's name originally was Bhimrao Ramji. And uh, his teacher's name, was, uh, was a, who was a Brahmin, was uh, Ambedkar. So he said to escape uh, uh, discrimination, you take my name. And that's how he took this name and went to Columbia. And he got his PhD there, went to London School, got a DSC, that is a Doctorate of Science in Economics again. And, uh, uh, the, uh, 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 and then now he got the law degree and became uh, the mover of our constitution. He's not called a Pandit. Another politician who has never passed an exam, he's called Pandit. Just because he was born in a particular family, these are all deteriorations that have taken place. They are things that we have, therefore we have to start all over again by telling the people the truth. These divisions are today artificial. I don't know how they are financed. Many of them are financed by anti-Indian forces. So we'll deal with them. But there's nothing that's happening in India which you can say is alarming. All these are well under control. Thank you, sir. Uh, this is Harikuma. There is a lot of difference between urban area and rural area in India. If you want to say the development country like America and Russia, how to overcome this gap between urban area and rural area? Yeah. The only way is two. I mean, there are only two ways. And both ways are necessary. First way is start giving focus to agriculture to become an exporting sector. That means build cold storages, small airfields, packaging industries, and so on. Assist the farmers to, to export. And today the farmers are so intelligent that many of them are using internet. I've seen that. I've seen fishermen using mobile phones uh, to get weather reports uh, on GPS. So uh, I think we should use modern technology to elevate agriculture as not a subsidized sector, but as an exporting sector. And, there is, and then, of course, you'll have to fight like hell for that in the WTO, because Europe, which sells milk at six times the price of India, uh, will not let our milk come, because they will have uh, internal problems. But we can also create internal problems for their industry here if they don't agree to a swap on that. <coughs> so uh, this is one way. The second way to bridge the gap is to build industries in rural areas so that people don't have to migrate. Uh, and that, that can be also done. If you remove, uh, if you create employment 
uh, by financing small and medium industries, make them efficient, give them the necessary equipment at subsidy, that is at uh, pay later, buy, take now. That will create a lot of, un uh, remove a lot of unemployment and create employment. These are the ways to do it, and uh, not by any forcible means. So we'll yeah. take one. Yeah. Yeah. Could there uh, be this? Uh, could this be the last question, or one more after we have? One more actually, we have two, okay. two people more. All right. So these Dr. three other three last right. questions. Dr. Swami. Yes. Uh, it's so great uh, listening to such a dynamic 25-year-old, <laughs> and, and and a fellow Hindu College alumni. Yes. Uh, my question is economic, but uh, we are willing to accept a political answer. <laughs> Why is the government not abolishing income tax? I think there are one or two ministers whom I won't name who think that uh, to discipline people we need income tax so that there's, unless the state creates fear, you will not get obedience. I think there's a very negative way, but at the moment they are sitting there, but don't keep, uh, keep the hope alive. I think we are going to change some things very soon. Thank you, sir. Good morning, sir. Uh, very impressive speech, and we had the backdoor discussion also. I have an American sitting next to me, and he keeps whispering in my ears that this guy is brilliant. <laughs> and uh, uh, that's because I was educated in America. <laughs> uh, sir, my question is: I work for a German exhibition company, and they all look at exhibitions as growth multipliers. Now, you said think out of box. I am thinking out of box, and I picture you, hopefully, you are the finance minister in future. How would you look at the Indian exhibition industry? And do you think the justice, due justice has been done to it? Or what would you change? Well, I mean, uh, what you need, you yourselves have put in on piece of paper. Uh, I think anything that publicizes, and brings the masses to see what we are doing, raises the confidence of the people, number one. Number two, it enhances your ma marketability. And therefore, we should create uh, industrial exhibition parks in much larger numbers, very much like you find in many other countries, so that this activity of yours should not be taken as something uh, which you are doing it for yourself. You are actually doing it for the overall atmosphere creation in the country towards um, you know knowledge of machines being uh, getting youngsters to think in terms of uh, how they can contribute these are things which I saw I, I certainly would make most of these activities as tax exempt uh, in your corporate sector thank you so much sir. this uh, last question here thank you very much your excellency I'm from Russia my name is Sergey uh, I am impressed very much uh, for your speech and for the future of India. Congratulations. Thank you. But only one uh, remark. Uh, you mentioned about uh, Jawaharlal Nehru, who is uh, very respected in, uh, in Russia. And we'd like to remind, uh, remind his, he, about history. When you bought uh, ice in States, Russian bought uh, first elephant from India uh, 550 years ago. So we invested since then to <laughs> India. Okay, okay. And during Jawaharlal Nehru also would like to remind that all heavy industry in India have been yeah. constructed by Russians, Soviet Union, and nuclear, and we uh, sent a lot of uh, high tech to you. Yeah. So, of course, uh, it was mistakes, but we, we, we would like to remind that why we got su such not effective economics, because it was uh, war. We have to be concentrate our power and energy in planning economy. That you're right, we was a little bit late. So uh, we start to uh, think how to improve. And my question, what is your opinion? What do you think about our Russian-Indian traditional uh, relationships in the future? What is your uh, point of view? Thank you very much. Well, first of all, uh, Russians may not have produced a great uh, economist, but uh, you produced uh, the tools for economics which no other part of the world produced. Pontryagin's maximum principle, uh, the use of control systems in economics. These are now which have transformed. The whole growth theory in America has been transformed by one, uh, uh, one uh, uh, discovery, and that is of Pontryagin, who uh, uh, converted the calculus of variation into a maximum principle 
And so because economics is mostly maximum and minimum, and uh, minimum is actually minus of maximum. So it's easy to co convert this. So tools for today's economic revolution in the West is by mathematics discovered by Russians. Now, uh, people like me have a little resistance to Russia because we identify you with Soviet Union. And during the Soviet period, I had hell, uh, thanks to the communists in our country. I lost my job, not once but twice, because the communists said a person like me should not be in the academics. And throughout the, the disinformation or active measures, as you call it, uh, was used against me throughout. Not only me, Moraji Desai, Jay Prakash Narayan. So that uh, impression needs to be removed that this is a, Russia is not Soviet Union. And that uh, you need to do some more uh, work in India in publicizing it. And uh, forget all your old friends. Think of creating new friends in India. Thank you very much, sir. Ladies and gentlemen, a big hand for our honorable member of parliament, Dr. Subramanian Swami. And may I request our president, IEIA, Mr. K.V. Nagin's Prasad, to kindly come up on stage and felicitate our chief guest for being here this morning. Thank you, sir, for gracing the occasion and for such a fantastic keynote address. Thank you so much for being so... Uh, for actually, you know, filling us with a lot of passion and with a lot of new ideas. Thank you, sir. You know, this is the befitting time when I'd like to say um, you know, to you, sir, to you, Dr. Subhanahu Swami, the heights of great men reached and kept were not attained by sudden flight. But they, while their companions slept, were toiling upwards in the night. And... He epitomizes that, and I'm very sure uh, under his ages, under his leadership, you know, we as a country uh, will also move forward. Thank you very much, sir, once again. Thank you.